set. All quiet on the set. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor College of Medicine. And we have a lot of new friends following us, so I uh, want to do a shout out for our new friends in Boston. And uh, glad you're participating in the Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, so again, uh, glad 2020 is gone. Uh, 2021 is here. Um, I heard uh, somebody say that, that it's now, you know, we're in 15 days, 16 days into January 2021. We've had the trial, you know, subscription, and they want to cancel. Because you know what? It ain't going like we want it to be going. Uh, it's going to be a rough uh, start to 2021, but I am confident. Uh, I am pretty confident. <laughs> I'm getting uh, confident that we will be okay still by the fall. But there's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. So you know, first to catch us back up because I haven't been talking about world numbers. Uh, you know, the world's a mess. Let's be frank; it's not going very well. We're up to half a million cases a day. We're approaching 100 million cases worldwide. Uh, the USLA, of course, is leading with 23 million cases, and India, a distant second with 11 million cases. Uh, worldwide, we've hit the 2 million death mark, and the USA is nearly 400,000 deaths. Just to put it in perspective, it's, I mean, it's bad. It's 10 times worse than the flu. But in uh, the Spanish flu uh, pandemic, there were almost 100 million deaths worldwide, so it's it's bad. It's really bad, but thank God it's not as bad as the Spanish flu. Uh, in Texas, uh, it, we've had a, about 2 million cases and about 30,000 deaths. And so in our region, the TMC, remember our R number, that infection number, that is the number of people, uh, you know, we infect if, we're, if we have the disease and meet a bunch of people who don't have it, is run, running between 1 and 1.5. Uh, if with, without any mitigation, uh, the R number for this particular coronavirus is between two and three. But with all the mitigation strategies, wearing masks, et cetera, we got, it's down to around 1.2. Our test positivity rate has continued to climb, but it's plateauing at about 15%. And the seven-day rolling average uh, is now pretty consistently uh, uh, over 3,000 cases, and that's that's really not good. That's uh, you can see it really well on this graph, the seven-day uh, rolling average of new cases. And as a reflection, our hospital numbers are going up too. And remember, there was a time when we were down as low as 70, 60 cases a day. Well, we're well over 300, and it will continue to rise. Uh, you know, remember, it's a lagging indicator until the new case number begins to fall. We will not see hospitalizations fall probably for a week that follows is that follows that uh, just to give you some uh, it's you know some uh, confidence the hospitals have not run out of capacity here in the Texas Medical Center or Houston in our region it has been very tough on rural communities that are that, that were small hospitals and didn't have a lot of resources and that's where the the epidemic is really hitting hard in those rural communities and they are out of capacity. And for, again, Los Angeles is really struggling and Chicago's not doing well. We're doing okay with regards to capacity. So there's not a problem with getting into hospitals. In part, you know, the governor you know, limited elective procedures and that's, that's probably some part of that. Uh, according to um, uh, Chris Amos's group, uh, our, our number has been sort of steadily been above one since about early November. And if you use that calculation, it looks like we will be, we, we should be at the plateau of the peak of this particular surge. Uh, I anticipate that sometime around early February to mid-February, we will begin to see that number uh, go down. And uh, we have been allocated, Texas has been allocated 2 million vaccines. Uh, one and a half million have been shipped. We've given about half of those uh, and about 100,000 people have been fully vaccinated. In the Texas Medical Center, we've given out about 150,000 vaccines, and 36 have been fully vaccinated. 36,000 have been fully vaccinated. Uh, so, you know, a lot of these calculations about what we can anticipate uh, is very, very much based on the R number, the infection rate of the um, uh, of the virus. And uh, you know, one of the problems, though, is if the virus changes. 
And that, is, if you'll recall, last week I talked about that 501 mutation in the uh, spike protein that was first detected in uh, England. And I want to spend some time uh, talking to you today about why it's important that we sequence viruses. Uh, it's not intuitively obvious why we should do this, but there's some very, very uh, good reasons. For one, mutations happen all the time. I've said this all along. It's an RNA virus. Mutations are always happening. You know, it doesn't mutate like some of the other viruses, like, you know, flu, for example, or HIV, but it's mutating. It's always changing. And the more viruses that are replicating in the world, the more chance there is for these uh, viruses to change. And they can either get less uh, infectious or they can get more infectious. And so one of the reasons to do constant sequence and surveillance is to be looking at, at what that viral re uh, resistance to the vaccination, how infectious it is, and also how virulent it is. So what, does it become more virulent, in, in other words, cause more disease in people? The second reason to do it is more of a retrospective look. Once you look at movements of these various viral strains across the world, you can get some really good evidence as to what you know, people movement and what virus movement uh, has to do with the global pandemic. So it's really important. It look, it, we really can track what are called clades. Clades of the virus are, are groups of viruses that have a common ancestor. So one change in the virus leads to a whole clade of ones that are related to that, that one founding member, but there are multiple clades, and you can follow these worldwide and see movement uh, from one country to another. That was like when we were try tracking the virus from China to Italy to the U.S. And then the third reason is forensics. You can actually figure out outbreaks by looking at virus sequences. And so those are the three real reasons to be doing it, and we're not doing enough of it. The UK is doing more, uh, some other countries doing it. We should start doing more than we are doing. So let's start off with why it's important uh, in terms of looking at vaccine resistance and infectivity and virulence. Well, this is, this is the UK 501 variant. Now, you can see what happened when the UK got this 501 variant. So we, we've been saying, well, maybe we're, we're peaking now and we'll be out, about, out of it by February. Well, not if this guy shows up. If this guy shows up, then we're going to have a, a whole lot of more uh, infections in February. So it's really important that we figure out that particular uh, variant. And remember, it's the one that I mentioned, uh, the 501 variation that's in right in the binding domain of the spike protein that binds to the receptor. Remember, we talked about it, it started, it was first detected in Kent. It quickly became the dominant strain in Kent, England, and all of southern England. Uh, and it is known as the B.1.17. Uh, it has another deletion in the spike protein, uh, and it has 17 amino acid changes, and eight of those changes are in the spike protein. Uh, and this was shown to be an uh, increase in transmissibility almost by 70%. That would convert that R number from between two and three to four and five, and that would mean we'd have a lot more infections and we would be, we, we'd be, be subject to a lot more disease in February and probably March as well. Uh, there's another mutant in South Africa that's slightly different, but in the similar domain of the spike protein, just within 100 amino acids away, it's called variant E484K. We haven't done as much testing of that, Right now, uh, we just got some news from uh, Pfizer, and actually this was a study in collaboration with UTMB, uh, that the vaccine, you know, looked at 20 people who had been vaccinated with the BioNTech vaccine, uh, and all 20, they, the plasma from all 20 neutralized uh, that, that uh, 501 variant from the United Kingdom. So that was really, really good news. They looked at 15 additional variations. Uh, and, they, and they also were neutralized. So one of the things when you would give this spike protein, you develop antibodies to various parts of it. And even when one piece of it mutates, it, it's very likely that you'll have an antibody to another part of it. So that needs to be a, an ongoing process where we're constantly sequencing. When there are changes in amino acid sequence, we're testing to make sure that there's no resistance. Uh, that is something that we are just beginning to do. Uh, uh, Dr. Fauci was on TV saying, well, we're doing it too. The United Kingdom's moving, we're going to start doing more of it. So I think that's really an important strategy that we haven't employed as much as we should. I mentioned the second one about clade uh, evolution and movement throughout the world. I'm not going to talk too much about that uh, today, 
That's more something we look at in retrospect to see what happened with movement of the virus throughout the world. But the third reason to do sequencing is forensics. So, you know, forensics is, helps you figure out outbreaks and helps you learn information from outbreaks. So there was a, a recently published study called the CHARM study, uh, which was done with Marine Corps recruits. Uh, there was also a study in the NFL that I'll talk about, but let's start off with the Marine Corps. Uh, these were new recruits into the Marines. Uh, they were asked as they came into quarantine at home for two weeks, and then they were put on a college campus and supervised quarantine for two weeks. Uh, and they, it, it was really very rigorous. Uh, they were tested by PCR as they came in on day zero. They were tested on day seven, and then they were tested again on day 14. And uh, like uh, most of these military operations, they were divided into 50 to 60 person platoons. And if they were symptomatic, they were immediately PCR tested. So they, they had a way to do that, but very few of, the, of them actually became uh, symptomatic. And they instituted very rigorous uh, public health measures. They all wore masks. There were social distancing, at least six feet, hand washing. They were sleeping two people to a room. Uh, all the bathrooms were, day, were sanitized on a regular basis. They, all the instruction manuals that they had were sanitized. Their personal electronics were sanitized. Uh, and they exercised completely outdoors. And they also employed, you know, unidirectional movement through the dorm. So if you entered one way, you could only exit one way. They did everything you could possibly do uh, to try and minimize infection between the various recruits. So of the 3,467 new recruits, about half of them participated in the study. Uh, and so what they found was uh, on the day they showed up, day zero, 16 of them were already positive and they were isolated. By day seven, there were 24 positive and by day 14, 11 positive. And, and there were a bunch of people who didn't participate in the study. So they had a total of 51 uh, of these recruits that became positive. Uh, and they had sequence on those. So if you looked at viral sequence thing, it turns out there were six different clusters that happened. Uh, and, and two of the clusters were a little bit larger, so you could actually uh, get some more information. This, uh, two of the clusters, C2 and C5, uh, had uh, six people that, that got infected. Uh, and what was interesting is the infection was distinct in the platoon. So it wasn't the same infection. Uh, it was very distinct. And what was really impressive uh, was that it was mostly roommate to roommate transmission. So all the other factors <laughs> seemed to work, but roommates infected each other. And where there, there was one hallway where the two platoons were together and the, the, the room between, that separated the two platoons ended up being infected with one of the platoons uh, uh, particular viral strain and not the other one. But it was very distinct. So. Uh, it was very clear that roommates were transmitting to each other, to each other or the activities within the, uh, the, within the platoon were doing it. There, and so there's, it, there was a couple of really important conclusions. The first thing was you couldn't pick it up by, uh, they, were, they were doing screening of symptoms. Well, nobody had symptoms, so it was, you, it was totally ineffective. The only way they picked it up was by having these regular scheduled uh, you know, every seven days testing. So you can see where the colleges that have been successful have been doing regular scheduled testing because that's the only way to really pick it up. Uh, and that transmission was uh, really not from contact of things. It was really by having roommates. So we had close contact in a room uh, was really responsible. Uh, and, and it shows that, you know, using sequencing testing or using symptom testing is not very effective. But regular testing, you know, uh, sort of surveillance testing is effective. So lots of good information from that particular study from uh, the uh, marine recruits. Well, there's another one example, the Ravens. God bless the Ravens. But they had a great outbreak. Uh, they had 20 players that tested positive. Uh, and it was interesting. In that 20, those 20 players, there were four different variants. Uh, three of the variants came from the community. So uh, three of the players were clearly infected in the community and then you know, found to be positive, not from the test. Uh, but the 17 players that were positive all got it from the strength coach while they were working out. So you know, classic example, everybody's wearing their masks, they're following all these rules, they go into the weight room, and people take off their masks and start working out. And guess what? You breathe hard. 
it sounds a lot like that chorus in Washington where one person infected 20. Well, this is exactly what happened. The strength coach infected 17. Uh, and so, you know, when you go to your exercise room, one of the reasons I was very negative about gyms uh, and, you know, exercise rooms is people go in there, it's an enclosed space, and they start exercising, breathing hard, and guess what? You get a lot of transmission. And so now they've instituted, you know, even while exercising in the weight rooms and strength rooms, they all are wearing masks. But you know what? That's kind of a little bit too late. So again, we learn a lot about this, uh, these kinds of spread of this particular virus uh, and how to practice uh, uh, you know, better public health measures, because we need it. Until we are vaccinated uh, and reach herd immunity, we're gonna have to continue to practice uh, really strong public health measures. Now, just a comment on, on the, um, the, vaccine, the vaccine rollout. Obviously, this is a federally, uh, uh, it's managed at the federal level. It goes to the states, it's allocated to the states, and then each state has been a little bit different. We follow the CDC guidelines, but not, not exactly the same. And I will tell you, no one's got the perfect strategy. Uh, some are trying to do it in, you know, by one, group 1A, 1B, trying to follow the CDC guidelines. Others have just said anybody over the age of 65, like Florida. Some have focused on large sites, uh, you know, like opening up the stadium. Uh, others are trying to do it through drugstores, et cetera. So lots of different things. Be patient. We're all trying to figure it out. Uh, we're making the best decisions we can. Uh, obviously, we're all waiting for, um, you know, more vaccine to be available. When the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines become available, I think we'll see a, a pretty dramatic uptick in utilization. So uh, lots of new uh, uh, stuff going on in the beginning of 2021. We're in the midst of a very bad uh, surge. I'm hopeful it is, it's peaking. It depends on whether or not we start getting these, uh, these uh, very infectious uh, variants here, and hopefully we'll start doing a little bit better on surveillance. Uh, but Baylor College of Medicine is doing the best we can. We're, we're, we're vaccinating as many people as we can of our patients based on the vaccines we get. Uh, and I'm very proud of the Houston community. Again, we are working together trying to get vaccines out to the most vulnerable. There are areas of our uh, city and our county where people have limited transportation. We have to figure out ways to get the vaccine to them. So as I come to, I just want to end uh, uh, this week, uh, we have the Martin Luther King uh, weekend coming up. Uh, on Monday, we obviously honor uh, Mar Dr. Martin Luther King. That's a federal holiday. Uh, it's time, I think, to, to really think about the, the great things his life repre represents. Uh, Dr. King was uh, abs you know, absolutely a visionary and a leader for bringing people together. We should think about that uh, this weekend. Let's all think about how we can work together, be uh, good citizens of the United States and, and, and work, work for the benefit of our fellow man. I mean, the most important thing that this, this particular pandemic has really been disproportionately uh, the burden of communities of color, under-resourced communities. Now's the time for us to think as a country about why that happens and why we should try and fix that. Uh, at the very least, we need to come up with a vaccine strategy to make sure we can begin to enter uh, intervene in those communities in a positive way. So uh, my goal for this weekend is to think about all the great things that we are as a country, uh, all the things that uh, Martin Luther King espoused and try to be uh, a better person and a better organization. Uh, so have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy your day off on Monday and I look forward to seeing you.